things. In this discussion, we will not only evaluate the act's effectiveness in combating cybercrime, but we also want to explore how it can be enhanced to keep pace with emerging technologies. Our goal is to ensure that the CMCA remains a robust tool for securing our nation from both a social economic and a national security perspective, whilst also respecting citizens' constitutional rights, including the right to privacy and freedom of expression. This afternoon, it's all about having a stakeholder conversation in the true spirit that is Kicktonet, our host today. That's exactly what they embody when they convene us. So all of us are encouraged to actively participate. We will break the areas of focus into eight main questions, and we will give each panelist two minutes to respond before opening the floor to you, our participants, for a further five minutes so that any of you who want to contribute, please feel free to. And as such, we urge you to post your desire to contribute and or any questions in the chat box so that the Kicktonet team can guide us during the session when we open it up to you participants on who is going to talk. Housekeeping done. Now, I'm honored to introduce our distinguished panelists, each of whom brings a wealth of expertise in the field of cybersecurity. Brian Yali. Brian, can you put your camera on so we see you? Brian, yes, there's Brian. Brian is an adept cybersecurity professional specializing in risk consulting and forensics. Brian has extensive experience experiencing critical infrastructure consulting and telecommunications. He currently serves as the MSIP security manager at Ericsson, and he's focused on driving security enhancements across diverse environments throughout the region. Brian, we're honored you're with us today. Karibu. Thank you very much. Our, our next expert this afternoon is Lawrence Muchiliwa. Lawrence, are you online? Do we have, can we see you? There you are. Lawrence has over 10 years experience in the ICT industry, and he spent the past eight years specializing in cybersecurity, particularly in the technical management of CSETs, computer security incident response teams, as well as policy and strategy implementation. He is an ACDF fellow, and one of the first African regional liaisons actively promoting collaboration within the industry. Lawrence, Karibu, and thanks for being here with us this afternoon. Uh, pleasure our, is all mine. Thank you so much. Our third panelist, who I'm going to introduce in absentia, so that when he joins us, he just loops himself into our conversations, is somebody who all of you, I'm sure, know. John Walubengo. John is a uh, Owalu. To those of us Sorry, who are I thought I'm around. I'm... Oh, you're around! Ah, Walu, Kuba, yeah. and you, and you're here. <laughs> I, I've been around for a while, eh? but this is how I look like. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is a seasoned ICT professional. Walu, I think that means we are old. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So Walu is a seasoned ICT professional with over two decades of experience, and he holds an MSc in Strategic Business IT and a BSc in Mathematics, Sama Kirinyingi. His expertise spans ICT governance, security, policy, and strategy. John has held key positions such as an IT, IT course director at Strathmore University, and he's a founding dean of the Faculty of Computing at the Multimedia University. John is a guru. He has served on critical national task force, including those of blockchain, AI, and data protection. So, Karibu to our panel of experts. Um, so, let, let's jump right into our conversation, starting with our first topic. Um, assessing the CMCA's effectiveness in cybercrime prevention. And we all know that to effectively review the CMCA, we must begin by examining its core purpose of deterring cybercrime and ensuring digital security. So I'm going to pose two prompt questions to the panelists and to our participants that we can have a conversation around. 
What do you guys think has been the CMCA's most significant achievement in preventing cyber crimes? And secondly, what are the key areas that still need improvement to enhance the act's effectiveness? Brian, we'll start with you. Um, thank you very much, Mudeo. I think to kick us off, I'll have to say this. For us to even be in a position of uh, evaluating the effectiveness of the CMCA, it means we have something that's in place. So we won't discredit and say that there's nothing in place. It took a lot of work, a lot of effort from the industry, from players, from many stakeholders to put this in place in the first place. And that was a great initiative. And we truly appreciate the work that was done by all the people who came together to make this possible. Now, we're at the point where we're looking at it um, a few years down the line, and we're evaluating how effective has this been. Unfortunately, on my part, I will say that it has been partially effective. Partially effective is because for those who have been able to read it or appreciate it or get to understand it, then it does work as a deterrent. However, for those who may not even know it exists or may not have knowledge about it, then it's completely ineffective because there's nothing they stand to benefit from it as, as is because they have not gotten to appreciate how it would help them, how it helps the organizations that they work for and how it plays a key part within our country and also trying to secure our digital systems. Indeed, we, we really need to appreciate that we do have a legislation in place. And I totally agree with you. Lawrence? So I think I just echo what Brian mentioned. I think now at least we have regulations, uh, which means we are multiple steps in the right direction. So to answer some of the question, what am I, I think, happy with the CMCA? Uh, first of all, we have regulation. We have an act, which means even from a legal point of view, right now, some of the issues that the country, both from a, a national private point of view that we're facing, there's legal backing behind it, uh, which can give you reprieve, both as an individual and also uh, from a, a governmental uh, point of view. If you look at the four, uh, I think around five objectives uh, of the act, so all the way from protecting confi confidentiality, integrity, availability, and lawful use of computer system, uh, facility. Uh, to facilitate the prevention of all this malicious activity, it can be harder to effectively measure the effectiveness of this act. Because if you are going to measure the effectiveness, it also means that we need to be, we need to have some data points that we can actually use and say, look, three years ago, we had X number of cases that were being prosecuted. All of these cases were being thrown out of court because uh, they didn't have uh, the right like, legal bag backing from a cybersecurity point of view. I struggle trying to get those specific statistics. And, and I believe those are some of the most important statistics that can actually use, uh, that can actually be used to measure effectiveness. However, on the other sides, we have uh, regulations. So I think I'll just point out the one of the biggest regulation that came from the CMCA, which is around protection of a critical infrastructure. Now, I believe those regulations are now trying to put some sort of um, protection, effective protection in regards to how entities in that space can protect the infrastructure. So it's moving away from a best effort. Look, I'll do it if I feel like doing it. It's going to cost money and probably now moving towards I run infrastructure that is very critical to this, to the nation. And if it goes down or if anything was to happen, we are going to have a real impact. And now I'm being mandated legally to ensure that I'm putting in this best practice, best effort. So I think from that point of view, I'm very happy. And lastly, the act is also promoting uh, international operation and now even from a legal point of view mm -hmm. and uh why i say this is important is that 
uh, from my eight to five, the organization I work for, uh, Forum of Incident Responders and Security Team. This act is allowing such organization to better collaborate with the interna- uh, local entities. So it's mm-hmm. easier for a specific entity to talk to either NC4, to talk to the Kenyan start, talk to DPC, and work together on intervention that they can bring in, be it technical support or financial support to establish or fast track some of uh, the mandate or objective that uh, the act and the regulation have put in place. Thank you. And that's that's really informative. And I'm going to pick up one of your points there that you said about international cooperation and even na- uh, local cooperation, because cybersecurity is a multi-stakeholder platform. And for us to effectively combat cybercrime, we need that um, cooperation, both at the local, regional, and national stages. So um, that, that that's that, that's great. Dugiangu, Walubengo. Yes, yes. Thanks, Mateo. Uh, Like the other panelists have said, at least we have the act. There are some countries that haven't even gotten around having a cyber crime act. So that's a plus. Um, As to how effective it is, I think it's uh, it's, uh, mixed outcomes in the sense that uh, um, we have defined quite a range of offenses to enable our courts to to deal accordingly. Um, But you find that uh, once in a while, or probably too often, um, government uses the Cybercrime Act to settle um, uh, probably political scores or to settle um, issues that are not necessarily criminal. So, it, it's it's like the Cybercrime Act was uh, rightly created to deal with cybercrime. And it, to some extent it does. If you look at crime around M-Pesa and what not, it has sorted that out. If, if, if for example, you, you receive um, uh, M-Pesa that wasn't meant for you, you received it in error and you chew it, you can be taken to court and there's a provision of how many years you can serve if found guilty. So it has defined some of the key offenses, uh, but it, you find that the typical people being taken to court around this act may not, not necessarily be uh, cyber criminals, probably they are more of uh, political activists. And so it becomes a challenge between freedom of speech, freedom of expression, vis-a-vis the Cybercrime Act. The other challenge I think I can mention is the um, constitution of this body called NC4. I think the act allows uh, the, 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 the members of NC4, um, it's heavily gava, you know, PS Interior, PS IT, PS Treasury, Marathon in general. So it, it is heavily government. And then you find very little presence of private sector, if at all, academia. And, and, and then that means that you have a body with a lot of power over something that is on a day-to-day basis not in their hands. So for example, um, Safaricom one of the largest networks in this country, if they're not represented on that body, then it it becomes quite uh, sort of difficult to either enforce or leverage on the experiences. I know there are provisions where uh, they can declare or probably already declared Safari a critical infrastructure, and then now they have to behave in a certain way. But that kind of command and control structure tends to to be less effective as opposed to where you are collaborating, you know, because if I'm just told I'm a critical infrastructure and I have to behave this way, yes, I'll try to behave this way. But if, on the other hand, I was invited at the table from the word go, guess what? I will do more than what the law expects me to do in as far as protecting our cyberspace is concerned. So I think the 
to have more impact, we need more uh, representation at the NC4 level from academia and private sector. And who knows, perhaps even civil society. Thank you. Thanks, Walu, for, for those insights. And I think what we've seen is a resounding um, threat is that we have an act in place. We have regulations in place. We have designated crimes um, in place. Um, we've got modalities for information sharing between ourselves and international organizations, which is important for cybersecurity, especially cybercrime, which is a transnational crime. That's really important. Um, when it comes to our APEX organ, NC4, indeed, um, under the Act, it's heavily um, government constituted. But I'm going to throw a question before we open, once we open the floor to the panel. Um, if Kenya is looking towards setting up a national cybersecurity agency, which maybe would address some of these challenges, Wally, that you've raised about NC4 being the one controlling it, but it's predominantly Gaba, and yet a lot of our critical infrastructure is in the private sector. Now, this national uh, cybersecurity agency hopefully would be a partnership between Gaba and the private sector, because a lot of our critical infrastructure, as you aptly put it, is in the private sector, and we need them to have a seat at the table so that they can own the journey for both uh, social economic and national security interests. So um, what would you guys think about an entity like that? And I'm now going to open the floor to either the panelists or any participant who wants to make a comment. Yeah, I could go first. Yeah, the, the a cyber security agency will be quite appropriate. And I think in my other role in the sector working group, I saw that as a, as a proposal. Um, it could form um, a platform where you get more, you know, uh, feedback or collaboration between academia, private sector, civil society, uh, and it envisions that each those each of those key stakeholders would sort of build a a SOC, um, a security operation center that is then aligned to to the National Cyber Security Agency. So I, I think that could begin to address some, some of those, those challenges. Um, but as usual, um, the, the, the implementation aspects of it, so for example, uh, we are all aware there are tensions already between um, some SOCs. I know uh, the, the Communication Authority has a SOC, okay, and then we we hear ICTA also has a SOC, and like both of them are presumed to be the national SOC. <laughs> so at the end of the day, you find a lot of fiefdoms coming in and clouding the overall agenda, uh, and so the, the, the legal infrastructure could be right, but if you get the wrong people running those agencies or those entities, what you end up having is uh, people just clashing over who is more powerful than the other, rather than looking at the emerging threats and how to address them. Thank you. Thanks, Wally. Brian, Lawrence, do you have any comments? Brian? Yes, um, I'll, I'll also echo Walu's sentiments. One of the biggest challenges we have is now getting these things to be in place and start running. And yes, we may set up the infrastructure, get you're getting logs coming in and you have uh, people on the ground reviewing these logs and all, but where does how does that collaboration come up? How does the information get channeled from this entity to the people to the wider audience who would consume this information, who do they know to reach out to? Will they reach out to the KESAT? Are they reaching out to NC4? Are they reaching out to ICTA whenever they have a challenge? Or how do they follow that chain? Who, who do you call whenever there's a problem? You know, will you raise a ticket with KESAT and then you'll follow up and need to raise one with ICTA? And then you also need to reach out to another agency or another authority. So, yes, this is good in, in and of its nature and what we want. However, 
there's so much confusion even as it is in the industry in some cases where you don't know should i reach out to this or this or this or who do i listen to yeah you'd want to hear certain information when we're having the ddos and everything uh, targeting certain infrastructure you're waiting to hear something from one entity yeah, you hear something from a different one so who do you listen to is there a common channel is there a common effort towards dealing with these issues so that's where there'll be a lot of um teething in terms of that but it really needs to be addressed we need to have a clear indication of how this is going to be handled who is going to be in this space and at the end of the day we're trying to work towards one common goal of securing our cyberspace and our critical infrastructure and such kind of systems to as well also put it inviting people to the table vis-a-vis declaring an organization critical infrastructure and telling them to meet certain requirements yet there's no financial support to them you require me to put in place certain technologies those things come with a heavy expense for buying the infrastructure it's itself heavy expense in buying licenses heavy expenses in maintaining it running it supporting it and it's a lean team you may find one system administrator in a certain critical infrastructure is the one who serves as the network administrator as the it manager as uh, all these roles all in one then you want to heap security security onto him with no additional budget with no additional support it truly becomes unfair and unrealistic so they'll just leave it and another incident like, like that happens and then you call and shout and call out uh, such organizations but they really have nothing in their pocket for them to even implement such controls so as we think about these things it also has to be thought of how can these people get support if there's an issue who do they even call how do they get assistance will they get people with experience on the ground to come and help them and guide them to recover from certain situations but if they have no information then they're left to make their own decisions and at the end of the day someone will opt to get services back as fast as possible and in the same way they may in that way um compromise all the evidence that would have been used by forensics experts to come and uh, identify who could have been been behind such an act an activity or an act and at the end of the day now that can't be prosecuted because the evidence was tampered with but this person did what they know best they don't have that technical training they don't have the capacity so the best thing they knew is to restore services but in restoration they have um, cleared a lot of evidence that could have been helpful elsewhere so it's it's a very difficult one and we need to align all this uh, organizations to be on the same page otherwise we'll have another agency but effectiveness will still be zero to none i agree with you because this silo method that we are embracing is very dysfunctional and that's why hopefully this national agency can take away the dysfunction of the silos we are currently operating have one united agency where everybody is in it and it will also alleviate a lot of the trust deficits let's just call a spade a spade as a as a as a financial institution if i have a cyber attack i'm not about to be as quick to even report it because if there is a leak on that there'll be a run on deposits so even the information we're getting so banks are reporting amongst themselves you know keeping it there but we're not getting all the information that we require because of that let's just call a spade a spade trust deficit and reporting mechanisms so maybe by setting up this agency which has the trust which has the security features which everybody is plugged into where the sector uh, socks uh, se- sector sets can now report to this might be the way to go but once again but i agree with you it should not just be another silo it will just add more confusion <laughs> to the pot lawrence i don't know if there's anything you want to add to that yeah so uh, i might take a slightly different approach now <clears throat> maybe we need a, an agency maybe we don't uh for me it's all about what values the agency going to introduce factoring in that we already have nc4 we already have uh, the ke is that we have ca and uh, we have icta so i believe if that is evaluated objectively then a decision can be made on whether we need us uh, we need an agency 
agencies have worked in other nations, other nations they have totally not worked. And uh, Kenya is still considered at least regionally and even globally at a very mature level cybersecurity wise, both from a technical and governance point of view. Uh, and that speaks of something. I think one of the challenge we face as a nation and uh, a lot of this blame is to be taken and hopefully handled uh, by the various uh, national bodies. There is a lot of uh, inadequate awareness, both from a, a governmental point of view and also from a, a, a private sector point of view and also from a citizenry, a citizenry point of view. The role of, for example, of the national SAT is very clear. They are the focal point when it comes to cybersecurity matters. However, we also have a NC4, which now introduces a, a very interesting uh, interesting mix. If you talk to, uh, so, in, so when you talk to people on the ground, you will be told that uh, the team at CA is the national SAT. So ideally, any matters affecting the national will be handled by this, uh, the national SAT. <clears throat> any issues that are affecting the government are meant to be handled by ICTA because ICTA takes the responsibility over being the government SAT, which, is two, which are two different things. So government will focus on government. National more or less has a very... Uh, a, a more wider reach. Both the national SAT can interface with the government SAT, it can interface also with the private sector SAT. Then if you come to the private sector, we have TESPOC. And TESPOC is considered as the sector SAT for the telecommunication community. Then if you go to the ICS, so the Power Energy XYZ, you will also hear very interesting murmurs that they also have their own sector SAT as much as uh, it has a lot of bureaucratic challenges here and there, but they have uh, their own sector SAT. If you come to the academic sector, Kenneth, I believe is considered as the sector SAT uh, for the academic sector. If you go to the financial sector, I also believe they are also having some interesting issues. Uh, depending with who you talk to, they will tell you that our sector SAT is uh, at Kenya Bankers Association or You'll also hear other guys say that, okay, this is meant to be with the CBK. And if you have an idea of all of this, it can remove a huge chunk of the confusion. We also see even from professionals, uh, all the guys in this panel, the confusion also at times you have of who do we talk to? But at the same time, I believe the rule of thumb is always, uh, if you are unsure of who to talk to, you talk to the national SAT. If you are conflicted, do I talk to the Kenya uh, NC4 or the National SAT? You can actually talk to both of them because if we bring in the aspect of NC4, now NC4 is a, a coordination committee, which has a, uh, the committee itself and also the secretariat. All of these guys we have mentioned uh, will find themselves being represented uh, at NC4 by nature of uh, KESAT because KE SAT as the national SAT will more or less oversee all these other sector SAT and work very uh, closely with them. So I think I'll go back to my first point. Do we need an agency? Maybe, maybe not. Regardless, I believe we need a lot of awareness for us to appreciate where we are, the various instruments we have, and ensure we are maximizing them before we we try to introduce another agency that might be beneficial, bring in uh, value, or might be counter beneficial and just introduce additional uh, bureaucracy. I, I, I agree with that, you know, um, and it's good to look at both the pros and the cons of this agency. Uh, but maybe who knows if, if as Walu was telling us in the sector group, they're saying that they will have different sector sets, this may be a way to help KSAT because KSAT cannot actually handle everything. They'll be too overwhelmed. But if you have sector sets who then trickle up to KSAT, so if I'm financial, if I'm education, if I'm whoever, then they handle and even their, the trust amongst that sector set will be higher 
than when you're sharing with a wider group. Then finally, you only escalate certain things to KSERT. So um, I guess time would, would tell how that goes. But let's quickly yeah. jump. Uh, maybe just uh, uh, to reiterate on a point there. But uh, I think we already have a sector search. And, uh, and just to agree with you, the reason why we have sector search is because the national search, KSAT, can't do everything. And it relies on these sector search to work with them. And these sector search basically escalate to KSAT. However, also the sector search have their own challenges, which I think need to be addressed amongst those species. They have interesting challenges, which at least from what I hear, becomes counterproductive. What they are meant, the value they are meant to add specifically to KESAT might not, might, is not being felt at certain level, which now re leads into a situation where KESAT is still maybe handling a lot of things and uh, creates this notion that we don't have sector sets. So I, again, uh we, we i think we still need uh, uh that just awareness not only on the sas and c4 but also the sector sas and importantly uh, i think brian mentioned the issue of finance those sector sats need to be empowered both from a technical capacity point of view financial point of view for them to effectively deliver their mandate i, I just wanted to add that thank you Thanks for that. I, I see you have something to say. Yes, yes, just to say that the, the so-called sector sites that Lawrence is referring to, the they're not like recognized in law. <laughs> I'm from academia, and in our mind, we think Kenneth is our SOC um, or site, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but as, as he has mentioned, assuming we say Kenneth is our SAT, Kenneth will then ask the universities to contribute to financing that SAT. And Kenneth cannot ask universities that question because uh, the university will ask Kenneth, who said you are the SAT for the sector? <laughs> who told you? <laughs> and so even when a university wants to contribute to the educational SAT, the legal infrastructure is not there. And the, the Auditor General can really put you to task. Who told you to release this amount of money to this, in quotes, amorphous body? So at the end of the day, the, the understanding between the techies is there, but in the absence of a clear legal framework, then you end up in what we have now. People know the sites just because they belong to that sector, but outside that sector, nobody knows. Uh, or people within that sector assume you are the SAT, but the so-called SAT itself is saying, but you've not financed me, so what makes you think I'm the SAT? And neither can they access zero finances because they will be asked so many questions in terms of who the hell are you? So at the end of the day, this the structure that the, the sector working group had in mind is not to change so much what is happening, if I may say through rumors, but to sort of empower it and make the those positions very clear obligations, responsibilities, uh, and expectations uh, from everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Walu. And it's true, as a lawyer, I was going to point that out to him as well. We need to formalize those sets and put them down in a legal framework so that they're effective. I want us to quickly skip over to a new topic, um, which I'm sure is going to bring a lot of interest. It's balancing cybersecurity and privacy, as well as strengthening safeguards against abuse. Walu had touched on this at the beginning when he talked about how sometimes some of our provisions are being used contrary to what we thought they were being put there for. And I think um, when, as we're evaluating the CMCA, we need to okay. look at- Did she freeze or I froze? It's, it's you who's frozen while we- Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, you can still hear me? So um, we need to look at the ability of the CMCA to balance cybersecurity measures with individual privacy rights particularly in light of the recent Gen Z protests. 
that highlight the tensions between digital activism, street protests, and the potential misuse of personal information despite data protection laws being in place. Has the CMCA affected our privacy rights in Kenya for the good, for the positive, or for the bad? Are the current safeguards adequate to balance cybersecurity and privacy? And when you talk about that abuse that you mentioned at the beginning, Walu, what are the current safeguards within the CMCA that secure us from abuse? And how can these safeguards be enhanced? So, um, Walu, we'll start with you. Yeah, yeah. So I think I had mentioned that the Cybercrime Act main objective is to deal with cyber criminals, but within those provisions, uh, you find you find state agencies um, arresting citizens and figuring out how, how best to deal with them as per the Cyber Crime Act, uh, even where the charges or the offense does not neatly fit in 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 the realm of the cyber crime act perhaps it fits in can you hear me can i just cut you short i can see we have a comment coming from engineer obam before we move on to this topic can we take his okay sure. Maybe he's put it down. I, I was. I or maybe thought... he typed it in. I don't know. Yeah. So I, I was but saying he had that his hand raised. He it's... had his hand raised, so I'm not too sure if he can unmute and speak, or if he's not in a position to. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, yes Engineer Obama, we can. Sorry, Chair, I've I've taken you back uh, because I'd raised my hand. I was expecting uh, you to come to the audience to for questions but just a comment on this uh, issue of establishing a, na a national cyber security agency first of all i think that uh, the 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 we're talking about case at where in our laws is case at established that's one so we need formalized things i think we need to look at cyber security from a strategic approach so that we have an organized way of doing things. So case that was established by CA in collaboration with other stakeholders, international, but it is nowhere in our statutes. So I think having uh, a national cybersecurity agency will formalize some of this. If you look at NC4, at least from the time I was in government, I don't know it has changed the last two years, it is supported by a secretariat consisting mainly of seconded staff from government agencies. And as Walu said, I think Walu Lores that the composition of NC4 actually excludes key stakeholders, especially when you talk, look at critical infrastructure, including uh, some who are government, like for example, NOFB. Therefore, and also I think NC4 really doesn't have financial independence. If we are looking at something as critical as cybersecurity, we need to have the equivalent of APRA, of Central Bank, of CA, so that you know where you are going to if there is an issue. Today as it is, as Lauren said, I think you have to pick and choose who you think is your your, 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 your sector set. So establishing a national framework that uh, sort of looks at after our cyberspace is of paramount importance. And I think if we benchmark with the most successful countries that are, are, are considered to be the earliest of cybersecurity, they do have some sort of national uh, framework that then cascades down to different, you know, the different sides. And, uh, you know, I think it's important that we have this. I uh, do disagree with Walu that you have to have everybody there. I think what we need to do is have an, an, a government agency. Knowing how government agencies are set up is unlikely that they, they, they'll they have uh, civil society and everybody represented. But if we can get experts like the ones in this panel representing uh, the voices of industry and users, then the, that agency will make decisions that will make sure that uh, we, 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 we make progress. So I thought uh, I, I just mentioned that I do support the establishment of this because right now uh, we really don't have any statutory bodies that are mandated to manage our cyberspace. Thank you. As an engineer, and actually I agree with you, and I've been really pushing for this agency for years. So on a personal note, I'm happy that it's finally coming to fruition. 
And you're right, we can benchmark from other regions, you know, the UK, NCA, the US CISA, um, and it's a way to go more so as our digital um, transformation enhances and our threat landscape increases. Well, look back to you. Okay. Can we go back? Before that, there were two yes, questions. Yes, There are two questions, yeah. Mudeu. Two questions oh, for questions you. On the group. Maybe I can read them for you. There is one from Easton. It says, his concern is independence of the institutions to deliver this mandate without political interference or appointments. And the second one comes from Austin. He says, does the Computer Misuse and Cybercrimes Act provide for situations such as when Safaricom allegedly provided to the government open access to citizens' confidential information? Those two. Also, <laughs> <laughs> start answering. Uh, maybe I can say that we don't want to answer allegations <laughs> because we might find ourselves in very difficult position. <laughs> So Austin's question, I, I think uh, I will skip it strategically because we uh, we hear those allegations, but we don't know if they're true. But as for Eston about independence of, of, of the institution, um, and, and, and I think that's why I mentioned that if you have a bias of um, legally uh, mandated bodies in, a, in NC4, as compared to maybe academia or private sector, it it naturally will be biased towards you know the, the appointing authorities. So it is important to even as we reconfigure this to be a national cybersecurity agency, it's to think through how do we come up with a fairly balanced um, representation. Uh, and not just to to manage the power play, but also to bring something on the table. Uh, private sector should be there because they probably run 80% of our networks, as it were. Uh, academia, I think, should be there because they may provide uh, research input or they may have the capability to uh, even promote the development development of our own solutions in terms of uh, protecting our cyberspace. There are countries like Russia, for example. You don't expect Russia to be, you know, deploying American counter solutions. <laughs> so they must build capacity to uh, develop indigenous cyber uh, security solutions. And, and that kind of requirement will be easier if you have linkages with you know, academia and and that type of thing. Thank you. Um, maybe I can respond to uh, the question uh, Walu has diplomatically Actually, uh, handled. Oh, can we skip that question now that Walu has answered them so that we go to the next topic? So that I want us to not be stuck on the first question with your permission, with your indulgence. So if we can go That's back... Okay. Yeah, thank you. If we can go back to addressing the balance inside the security privacy and strengthening safeguards. Yeah, I think I had started the story. Let me just finish it off. Then the other panelists can agree or disagree with me. Um, it is clear that the state sometimes uses the Cybercrime Act to deal with matters that would otherwise be considered libel or uh, even ignored as part of freedom of speech or freedom of expression. Um, and in regard to the recent um, uprising, uh, you find that a lot of these Gen Zs were uh, arrested off the streets, uh, put in, in, in remand of police stations and some of their um, mobile phones started being accessed. Uh, most likely, I don't have the evidence, but most likely without the 
uh, provisions uh, that are stipulated in law. So, for example, before you go through my mobile phone, you need a search warrant. Um, I'm not sure if they were getting such things. Um, also, the the process of of uh, search and seizure are prescribed in law, but in a situation where there is an Sometimes you find this theory could be doing shots, protects you and I, but as to whether it is being followed, um, you know, religiously, it, it, it is probably 50-50. Thank you. Thanks, Walu. Um, Brian? Yes, um, definitely during this uh, period, there have been a uh, number of people who are some of those who are arrested and you could find their stories on the platform that is twitter or formerly known as x where people are detailing the experiences that you are out in a restaurant and this guys came bundled you into a car took you to some undisclosed location and you are released without any charges but they detain your phone and you go days on trying to get your access back to your access to your devices, but you don't have access to them. Now, it's it, it truly infringes on your privacy if there's clearly no charges that are being inferred on you and someone detaining your mobile device to go through it or whatever they may be doing. Um, it clearly infringes on privacy and does... Um, beg the question that we have this act, we have all these things on privacy, data protection, ETC, but if the same people who uh, we are hoping to enforce such kind of things uh, would not even follow them or abide by this, then what faith do you really have in these institutions in reporting cybercrime and such kind of issues to them for them to assist you? If they would themselves flout the same uh, rules and laws that are in place that would safeguard us. So it really begs a lot of, uh, and also brings us back to the initial uh, discussion we we're having about the effectiveness and all. There's a lot of trust that's broken. Then you'd want us to again trust you with enforcing this and trust you with seeing to it that this acts and these laws are seen through it. it it leaves us in a very funny situation where the people who you want to create awareness about the act towards and you want them to embrace it um, can't trust the people who are meant to enforce and support them in enforcing this and embracing this act. So th there have been cases of this privacy being infringed for sure, but the transparency is where we're really lacking. If they were transparent enough to even share with you those court orders and all those documents and tell you clearly why we're detaining this device, then I don't think people would have a problem. And if there was clearly something wrong, you can go to court and challenge whatever it is that they have done. But in this case, there's nothing provided. You've been tossed out and told to leave. Now, how do you even start that uh, conversation? How do you go back to the same police station where you are detained to report that I feel that this and this has been infringed to the same people who did it to you? I don't think that really um, encourages us to embrace this act and embrace the people who would be enforcing it. Yeah, those are some very valid points. Lawrence? Uh, it's hard to officers who have arrested you and report them for a crime that you that has not been documented. So yes, I was arrested by police officers, but what proves you arrested by police officers? Uh, the, the, the challenge I see here is uh, unfortunately, even as a country, uh, and it's unfortunate, uh, we are at a stage where we have selective uh, application of the laws that are meant to be equalizers. And depending on the situation, these laws can be used for you or against you. 
if you go through the act, the act is very clear when it comes to investigation procedures. Uh, what needs to be done for such and seizure or seizure of a stored computer data? What needs to be done in regards to inter interception of content data, real-time collection of traffic data, or uh, access over uh, that data? It, it's very clear on, on what needs to be done. However, is that being done? Uh, will, will you be told yes? So law enforcement is within, I believe, they are, as far as the act is concerned, within their mandate for them to talk to whoever they need to talk to, to intercept contents over data or communication. However, the act is very clear on how that needs to be done. It even goes a step further and uh, says that this needs to be done in the context of our existing uh, laws, for example, the Data Protection Act. But the question is, uh, is this being followed? Now, the unfortunate thing is, uh, and I think maybe something we should see is, uh, can we have uh, different bodies, even the civil society, trying to pick up this case? Because we have seen the value of our uh, legal precedence, what they have in the country. If something can be challenged in court, we saw this when the act was being used uh, uh, to undermine freedom of expression, where mostly political figures will take you to court because of X, Y, Z, and they quote the act. But when the court set a precedence and basically say that, no, you can't abuse the act this way, we saw, we saw that we saw uh, a reduction in abuse of that specific act. Uh, Say, uh, that specific section. So can we have legal precedence when a police officer or someone masquerading as a law enforcement arrests you, they take your device, go through them uh, during that time for late analysis, can they be taken to court and we see how court can actually handle that? I, I believe if we have that precedence, then we might actually see uh, mm -hmm. future interaction being handled totally different because the law enforcement sector will know that if we do this, uh, the courts are very clear. This specific action will be taken either against that specific police officer or against uh, that specific entity. Because even the act basically says, uh, I think it talks something about when you talk of offenses, uh, they talk around uh, offense as far as a corporate body is concerned and the role principles officer uh, take whenever an, an offense is committed as far as the act is concerned. Thanks for those insights. And um, um, I think just to summarize it, what you guys all seem to be saying is that the law is there. And I'll even say as a lawyer, the law is clear when it comes to investigative procedures. We have a whole part four as you actually put to Lawrence that deals with investigative procedures that need to be adhered to. So now the question is, is it that the law is inadequate or is adherence to the law the issue? Because as you guys have put it, when I'm being arrested and my crime is not being documented, maybe uh, the right procedures have not been applied as regards seizure and forfeiture of my devices. Am I going back to the same police who did that to me to report. And then it also begs the question, are the police doing this because they are aware of the law and they are ignoring it? Or is this part of the capacity that we need to build, you know, for the entire judicial circle, from the police officers who are used to just going to a regular scene and seizing things? What is that? Do they know how to even seize digital evidence or how to secure it? Maybe we need to start by enhancing their capacity as law enforcement enforcement officers. Then we move to the lawyers, whether they are prosecutors or defense lawyers. Do they know how to litigate these cases? Because as at last year, I think we only had about 200 um, cybercrime um, cases in the courts, and they were all in the lower lower courts, the magistrate's courts, which is like why, Brian, you said you couldn't find any statistics for them online because the Kenya law reports don't report those um, lower, lower court cases. And a lot of them were not even successful because of inadmissible evidence, you know, issues with evidence. And who collects the evidence? It's actually the law enforcement. So maybe sometimes we're saying the cops have done this, but have we built their capacity? Do they even know what we are, what we are talking about? You know, I'm not defending them. I'm just throwing out there for conversation. 
then the lawyers, how do they litigate these cases? And then finally, the bench, the judicial bench. These are the adjudicators of justice. Do they have the capacity to issue just and fair rulings? You know, so we this talks about also capacity building. So as much as we're saying we need to strengthen the safeguards, maybe as part of strengthening it is creating awareness. The public, what are your rights? So that my phone is not taken below me knowing what I what needs to be done. And those taking it to know what they must do um, to take it. So I don't know what, what your thoughts are on that because these days taking my phone away from me is taking my life. That's where my business is, my social life, my private life. You know, it's it's almost uh, a right, <laughs> a right mm -hmm. to exist. You don't have your yeah. phone, everything gone. So you just can't take it away. So I don't know what you guys think. Yeah, or I, anybody. I could say something on that. I, I think the this capacity within police, I think at DCI, they have a cybercrime unit. But then I don't think it is working well with the with, with that cop on the streets, you know, because these guys at DCI are very specialized. You may call them elite, but I, I'm not sure they are passing that information to 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 the regular cops on the beat. So when that guy arrests you, he most likely has not appreciated the the cybercrime or the ICT or the data protection side of things. Uh, so yeah, curriculum needs to to be probably revised at Kiganjo level, not just for the specialized elite police, so that at least they have a basic understanding of what is expected of them when they get a suspect who has digital devices. It's, it's not like you have every right to just go anywhere and anyhow leave. Uh, and violate the suspect's uh, right to privacy. Thank you. Brian? Yes. Uh, um, indeed, Mudeo, there's, there's a lot that needs to be done on the awareness uh, aspect of things. Even uh, as you've brought out in terms of the cases that have been in court, there are some I've been part of as an expert witness, and they've been running since 2019 or in 2024, running to 2025, without a case concluding. I mean, it's it really is frustrating in such kind of cases because you, you even lose uh, part of the energy to keep attending court because court can be out in Kisumu and you're operating from Nairobi or Mombasa and... For a session, you'll have to make your way down there, either facilitated by an organization that is pursuing that case or something of the sort. And it truly is unfair when you'll get there and court bounces. And that's that. Your day, your two days, your week is completely thrown out of the window. And again, to do with the court, there are times you go and you realize that there's a case, there's very good evidence, more or less, but a certificate of evidence was not obtained or was not gotten at the start of it all. And it crumbles everything because there are certain procedures that weren't followed or that were um, circumnavigated in a way of sorts. And as a result, it messes up with the whole process. All this time is wasted and a lot of effort that would have gone into securing um, the digital space and putting in precedence for other cases that would come in the future, all that has gone to waste. So there's a lot of education that needs to happen at multiple levels, at the law enforcement level, at the judiciary level, at um, even the public level in terms of awareness, where people know that they can actually take time to go and report cases, how they report them, where they report them. This is the follow-up that happens. And as a result, this is where we'll be able to see these cases uh, being prosecuted and such kind of things. But most of the time, we'll end up just seeing journalists or bloggers uh, paraded in court because of writing a blog about a certain influential person. So it really doesn't strengthen or build towards the... Uh, Cyber Crimes Act and making sure that what is actually prosecuted is real and true cyber crime and giving us precedents that we can leverage, follow, and build upon. So there definitely is a huge gap there 
and that it really needs to be addressed on multiple levels. And I really think that um, there's there's a lot that I know Kicktonet has been doing in educating the masses about cybersecurity and cybersecurity awareness. I, I really want to hope that we can pivot and also do the same around the Cyber Crimes Act, identifying cyber crime, handling digital evidence, reporting it, and bringing in also the aspect of IPO. I think IPO is supposed to provide oversight on the police. So how can someone who's been infringed upon know that they can report this and actually see it being investigated, dealt with? And if someone is found culpable, there are actions that will actually be taken. But if nothing is done by the oversight authority, then I mean, for the officer who's handling this, what stops them from doing it again and again and again? And, that, and that's very valid. And I'm going to throw a question back to you because you said you've been an expert witness in these in these cases, and it's true, they take forever. And um, we're wasting time when you could be helping us fight, firefight something else. You're busy doing this, and we already know we don't have enough capacity um, for you cyber firefighters. What would your take be on the creation of specialized courts? You know where we have specialized cybersecurity courts? Yes. Even the, the adjudicators, the people on the bench, mm -hmm. are trained. You know, like how we have the anti terrorism courts or the whatever courts. So we have the specialized yes. courts. So you're even coming before a judge who understands what what you're talking about. You have uh, lawyers who we are training, both at the ODPP and the Law Society, who specialize in these matters, because that might expedite it. Um, a little bit faster. And the other thing was also something Walu touched on. He talked about the DCI Digital Forensics Lab. Um, let's call a spade a spade. It's a good start. But we're talking about every 30 seconds, uh, a cyber attack is most likely happening. Before even we start putting in things like quantum computing, which may reduce this to every 15 seconds. And Kenya's cyber threat landscape with us embracing digital transformation is just growing exponentially. Assuming we pick up everything and we're running full steam ahead with our cybercrime um, uh, fighting methods, can that DCI forensics lab cope? You know, the answer is a resounding no. We no, actually yeah. replicated to every ward so that at every ward level, we have an equivalent DCI lab where when somebody comes in, they're quickly able to deal with that digital evidence because we know attribution in cyberspace is still a bane. Tracing that digital evidence is already problematic. Then you lose it or it's stored in a way that's deemed inadmissible. So these are, I mean, it's just something I'm throwing out to you to ask, what's your opinion? I definitely agree with you about the establishment of specialized courts. A cyber crime court would be ideal. Uh, there's some countries that already have it. And that's, that's really good because it allows us to expedite uh, dealing with such kind of issues. And the process is significantly easier because there's an appreciation of what you're talking about. There are times you may go and try and explain the difference between a user account and a person, and that's conflicting completely within the court because as far as certain people are concerned, the user is the person. So trying to explain that this account was used, but it doesn't necessarily mean it was Lawrence or Brian, that may not really play very well. And you'll end up having a back and forth and trying to use figurative speech and explain these differences. And that's a whole day gone without making much progress. So with the specialized courts, I believe we'll be able to gain traction on some of these cases. And if we're talking of the CMCA as a deterrent uh, to cybercrime, and it's taken over five years to prosecute certain things, then truly the same person who was involved in certain malicious activity is out uh, living life or moving on with whatever they were doing, then what's stopping them from doing it again if it will take another five years before anything happens to them? So we really um, don't gain much in terms of how slow things move and how difficult it is for us to present this evidence in court and have these people 
to add to what you're saying about the DCI, even in such cases, you'll have an investigating officer that you've dealt with when one case is starting. As it progresses, a new one is assigned and such kind of things. So even the continuity becomes a challenge over time. And these guys, they're not, infin- they're not infinite. So with the number of cases that are there, you'll find most organizations even pers- deciding not to pursue them in court because it's a waste of time. It will have them stuck with legal fees for a very long time over something that uh, they might as well just fire the employee and be done with it in such kind of cases. And it doesn't really help us long term because that employee, if they've gotten a slap on the wrist for getting away with millions of shillings or hundreds of millions of shillings, I mean, fine, you'll give them that slap on the wrist and they move on to the next organization and carry out similar if not to us so has it really deterred them or has it emboldened them that we take so much time in our court process um uh, related issues so it's it's a really it's a tough one to swallow and i empathize with the officers at the dci because i know they'll get calls every day from parastatals from organizations even the sat themselves there's only so much they'd be able to do but we need to and we need to empower these guys we need to have them getting enough support we need to also train people within these organizations the critical infrastructure that we talk about to know how to handle evidence so so that by the time someone is responding or coming in they've already preserved it in a way that is admissible in court whenever the time to prosecute comes so yes those are my my opinions and um, that's really that's really um, valid what you said. And I'm about to throw somebody under the bus, and I'm sure once this uh, call is over, she will shoot me. But we're so honoured to have on our participants today none other than one Madame Evelyn Micah, who is the head of cybercrime at ODPP, and also sits on NC4. So how can we be talking about? Uh, cybercrime cases and how their litigation and their problems. And I see Micah, Walu well, laughing because she knows I'm in trouble. <laughs> and I see Micah and I don't give her a chance to talk. <laughs> Boss lady, can we give you a chance to talk to us? <laughs> David, please give Micah a chance to talk. David, are we able to connect her? Huh? Yes, Mudeo. Um, we have one more question, perhaps. Oh, no. Can we connect Evelyn Micah to talk, please? Evelyn? Micah. To talk? Yes. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Give her rights to talk. Yes. Evelyn if, Micah, she's on the group. She's on the pa- not on the panel. Maika, yeah. check on the attendees and enable Evelyn, I can see Evelyn Joki, Evelyn Maika. Maika. Evelyn Maika is the head of cybercrime at the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions. Hi, Maika. <laughs> Hi, Mosleo. <laughs> You shall, you shall, you shall, we shall deal uh, offline. Sasa, big boss lady, we cannot be talking about what you do and not have you tell us what are your challenges or what have you seen has worked. Um, I'm sorry, I joined late, so I may not be okay. So, uh, up, up up to speed as to what you you guys have discussed yeah but just from your perspective but, from your perspective sitting where you sit um what do you, what what, mm-hmm. what do you feel that the cmca we've been able to achieve what are the challenges you guys you know you're the ones we took our ground who are dealing with it on a day-to-day what are the challenges and what do you feel we need to address to make it more robust and um a more powerful tool Okay. Um, 
I think the challenges that we've seen have already been um, highlighted. Number one is, of course, awareness. Awareness within uh, institutions, uh, even government institutions, awareness within the public, awareness within the public sector. So the, the question of awareness is, is the, the critical one for NC4. And even for us as, as, as ODP, it's something that we... Sorry, and I, I'm on the road. Apologies. So um, the question of awareness is critical. Uh, and it has already been addressed by your panel. So I don't, need, I, I don't need to belabor. And the other issue is, of course, capacity for the criminal justice system. Um, as already discussed, it's, it's, this is something that is uh, both technical. Uh, for, for us lawyers it's, uh, and for the police, it's, it's a technical area that we are catching up. We are, we are playing catch up. So uh, the question of capacity is it's critical. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. And Michael, let me ask you, when you've gone to court with some of these cases, what are the challenges that you've found that you guys have experienced when you're litigating the matters? Most most of the time, the challenges relate to evidence and the standards that are required under our Evidence Act. So there are certain conditions that evidence needs to meet for it to be admissible. Uh, some some investigators, as 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 rightly noted, may not be aware as to those conditions. So by the time this matter comes to court, there are certain conditions that have not been met, and therefore that makes that evidence uh, inadmissible. There's also um, a lack of awareness, so to speak, within the judiciary. Even even when, um, for example, there's a case that you need to investigate and you go to court and you need time, um, you know, the investigator needs time to, to to carry out investigations. And investigations for cybercrime cases tend to take very long, even in developed countries, tends to take very long. So you find that we've had very... Um, a short time to investigate, that means the investigations are not thorough, and that means that case will likely flop. So I guess it all boils back to what we said about capacity for the criminal justice system being um, a priority. And then let me ask you, finally, Michael, what would your take be on having specialized courts for cybersecurity? That's what we were also just talking about. Would they be helpful, you know, where we have specialized judges trained and where things can be expedited. I think, yes, that would be helpful. Even going by experience, we were, were when specialized courts were set up for anti-corruption cases or terrorism cases, you, you tend to see much more success mm -hmm. uh, because then the court is, is, is more um, effective if it's dealing with that particular thematic area there is room for building capacity fully for that court. So even I think international best uh, practices uh, is moving towards that direction of having a specialized uh, court for cybercrime. Noting that this is the, the, the current and future crime. Thank you so much, Micah. I, am, I apologize for throwing you under the bus. Thank you for what you do for us. <laughs> And thank you for, for inviting me. Um, I think I'd like us to move to another topic, unless anybody else has a comment to make on this. And I wanted us to look at emerging technologies. Um, because when we're looking at the CMCA, um, we, have, we have to look, how does it embrace emerging technologies like AI, blockchain, IoT, and quantum? you know, which are central to all current tech-centric conversations across all forums, as they offer great societal benefits, but they can also be used for nefarious reasons. And this necessitates a robust tool to combat these threats. So I don't know what you guys think, how well does the CMA address challenges from emerging technologies? And if it doesn't address them properly, what updates do you guys feel we need to put into it to keep pace with technological advancements? 
Lawrence, you've been quiet for some time, so we'll start with you. <laughs> so, uh, just, uh, I, I believe the CMC uh, does a good job uh, in uh, not keeping up with the emerging trends, which is a good thing. Uh, because uh, emerging technology, so for example, well, AI, the academics, I've heard this a lot from academics, has been there since uh, late 90s. But you have started seeing the hype, what, five years ago? But you see, acts are not, in my opinion, and I'm not, of course, a lawyer, acts should not be in the business of keeping up with technology. They should be robust enough to ensure that any emerging technology, so a few years back it was a blockchain, right now we are AI quantum, who knows, maybe a few years from now we'll be talking about Neuralink. I don't think there's an act that can explicitly keep up with those technology and still remain relevant. Otherwise, it will always be being reviewed, courts, et cetera, et cetera. But if we look at the CMCA, one, it doesn't really focus on on specific technology. I, I think the only technology I saw there was uh, on blockchain, where it's very specific blockchain. However, it does a very general, uh, it does a very good general job uh, in covering one associated crimes and issues uh, that can come or that can emanate from any technology that emerges. So from that context, I'm happy uh, with the act. It's very general enough allowing it to be adopted uh, for any technology or any emerging technology that comes along. Okay, I'll refer to my answer to, to my right to respond to that as a lawyer. <laughs> Let's have Brian go next. <laughs> well, yes, um, I'll, I'll partly echo what Lawrence is saying in that it does not explicitly address some of these emerging technologies, which um, as of the time it was coming out, I don't think we had really appreciated where we were going technology-wise in terms of uh, some of the emerging technologies that are coming up and, and, and all these things. Uh, were, I think most of the people were primarily worried about um, cloud computing and where data is being stored and jurisdiction and such kind of issues as of that point in time. And I think that one played a huge part even when we're talking about elections and finding out where the servers are, such kind of things. So there was a lot of um, um, buzz around those kind of things. But as technology does, every two to three years, we are completely in a different realm or space altogether. And uh, to be fair, I don't... I don't know if it will even be possible to keep updating the act that often. Uh, as soon as every new technology comes into play, we are now rushing to update the act. Um, sometimes we'll be updating it, and by the time we're getting comments, there's something new. So does the same team retreat uh, after presenting the initial findings to do the new thing for the new technology that, that has come into play? It may not be as easy to achieve that, but I think having it open enough um, or broad enough to cover the use of technology and emerging technology in the sense that we're talking about computer systems and such kind of things, it does give it a wider scope in that, yes, anything that is running uh, AI or this kind of things is a computer system of sorts. So it would be essentially covered in that sense. So it doesn't get too explicit into saying this AI technology or this blockchain technology or this cloud-related uh, technology. But for sure, I think um, we'll need to sit down and try and figure out how to broaden it enough to encompass all these things and to also safeguard us. I know even as we talk about data protection, these are things that will come into play when we're talking about machine learning and all these things. How do we treat this? How do we handle this? Um, how safe is the data and such kind of issues? So for sure, um, technology will always be drifting and moving in a really fast-paced paced, um, way. So we really have to sit down and think, how do we um, make sure our acts or laws are wide enough to encompass these things that will um, cover what is coming up in the future and also see how to now 
shift gears such that are we able to train also law enforcement in collecting evidence when it comes to such kind of systems? How do they collaborate with other countries that have dealt with issues around such kind of um, platforms or systems and collaborate to learn from them to also see how they can enforce certain things in advance. Also see what are these guys doing benchmarking with them? Are they changing their laws as well uh, based on the technology that's coming out or have they been able to put it in such a way that it already encompasses whatever is coming out in the near future? And, and essentially covering themselves from that perspective. So we still have a lot to learn and a lot to do, um, but I believe uh, we, we have a good place to start with in that it does talk about uh, use of computerized devices and all, which does essentially cover it to a certain extent. Now it's to look at what's out there and see, is there a need to go explicit or do we just need to improve on what we have uh, in one way or another that should cover us for some years to come. Thanks for that, Brian. Walu? Yeah, yeah, this this is always a philosophical question. Uh, some school of thought is that what is crime offline, you know, in the analog space is crime online. So there are people who think that all crimes in the real world have sorted out all issues in the digital space. Um, I then to lean on the other side where I feel that uh, whereas traditional crime is sorted to some extent, there are these new crimes or nuances that the way you have sorted the traditional crime cannot really be handled unless you also tweak the law. So, for example, I think a week or two ago we had about the alleged theft at Equity Bank and just reading from the media, the suspects pushed the money into cryptocurrency. Now, that is a totally new space. I know the CMA, the Cybercrime Act has um, a broad definition of blockchain, but uh, there is no specific offense related to that. Um, so obviously that becomes an area of improvement. Another example was last year, the WorldCoin saga, mm -hmm. uh, which was being investigated from a data protection point of view. But it turns out they were paying uh, Kenyans and operators in cryptocurrency. I remember in the parliamentary... Uh, committee investigating that saga, there were representatives from Central Bank. They were just asked one question. How much money has WorldCoin pumped into the Kenyan economy? They didn't know, and rightly so, because they don't know how to monitor cryptocurrency. In, in fact, cryptocurrency from a Central Bank point of view is obviously not legal tender, but more so they have a standing uh, circular warning banks not to deal in crypto. And so you, you get into a chicken and egg problem where central bank on one hand is not empowered to look into those things, and yet the crimes are happening, and then you go back to central bank and you're asking them, how comes you didn't know? <laughs> and yet the law has not sort of mandated them to know. Uh, and so technology has this type of nuances that the, the law must catch up with. Uh, obviously, technology comes first, then law must catch up, not the other way around. So there is sort of wisdom in saying it's not bad that the law doesn't know about this space yet. But within two to three years, we must have a way in which it catches up. And I think structurally you have uh, what we call regulations as an avenue for trying to catch up without necessarily having going to back to the parent law, which may take time, you know, building an act is, or revising it obviously takes three to five years. But I want to believe regulations could have a faster turnaround, and perhaps that's what we should pursue. 
how do we make sure that our regulations move in tandem with the technology? Thank you. Thanks, thanks for that, guys. And you know, um, Lawrence, uh, I disagree with you that we shouldn't define it because um, as a lawyer, I come from the school of thought that laws are there to prevent anarchy. So when we don't know what we're dealing with, it creates anarchy. So I kind of saw where Brian and Walu are, where we're talking about how do we enhance this definition in a way that people understand it. And this is where as a cyber lawyer, it becomes difficult. You're creating a law, you don't want to stifle innovation, and then laws have to be static. They can't be volatile where they're changing from time to time. So when you create it, it has to be static for a long period of time. And maybe a way to go is when we're looking at like the definition section of our CMCA, we can put a descriptive language into the definition of something like a computer system or even create a new term for new or evolving technologies, you know, using terms like innovations and dig uh, digital and information technology or cutting edge advancements in cyber tools, you know, to describe technologies that are developing or haven't been introduced because that will cover everything that is coming so that we have it um, specifically catered for. And we can, and, and instead of restricting it to put in examples, because right now we're talking about AI and blockchain and crypto and quantum is about to come and disrupt us and render all our current encryption mod modalities obsolete, there will be some, there'll always be something new. So we just need to put a generic, wide, broad space descriptive language um, to cover all of this. And maybe we can also look at it at uh, using criteria based definitions, setting criteria to define what is an emerging te technology based on factors like the novelty, the potential impact on society and the economy and their ability, ability to challenge existing legal frameworks. So these are all conversations we can have. But when we were, when the CMCA was being created, we hadn't looked that far into emerging technologies. But emerging and emerging technologies are here. And what we are calling emerging now, 15 years from now will be archaic and there'll be something new emerging. So when we get a chance, maybe it's just to have that broad-based description of a definition of emerging technologies. And then under the regulation, now be able to define how you you criminalize that emerging technology specific to its new ones. I don't know what you guys think or any of the participants feel about that. They're silent. Are people tired? <laughs> uh, we're getting there, but I agree with what you say. That yeah. uh, a, a definition is necessary in the in the parent act. And then we leave room for the regulations to 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 fine tune all that as and when it emerges. Thank you. So okay, so unless we have any other comments, maybe we can jump. To there was a later. question okay. uh, from Austin. He says uh, he has been in forums that agitate for special courts to handle cyber related cases with specially trained judges or prosecutors. He says, I see judges eyes almost rolling over when an expert witness gets technical in such a case. So I don't know where he, re he refers to. Okay, but I think we've addressed this question that Michael and Brian given to give his um, testimony of what happened to be to core ground. So maybe we can move to the next question. <laughs> Excuse me. Impact on businesses and the digital economy. So um, given the government's strong push towards e-governance, and currently we have, have over 16,000 um, services on e-citizen, and we're looking at having over 21,000 services, it's crucial to analyze the CMCA's effectiveness in securing businesses and indeed the digital economy, particularly in light of Kenya's reputation as a global innovation hub. You know, we're the home to Mpesa, we're the Silicon Savannah. So how, what impact has the CMCA had on businesses in Kenya? Has it enhanced our taking cybersecurity seriously and cyber resilience? Have there been any unintended consequences for the digital economy by having this law in place? And Brian, we'll start with you. 
Okay, I'll I'll take this from two perspectives. I'll go first, even looking at government itself. When we look at the CMCA, there are certain provisions that require uh, critical infrastructure to have um, certain protections in place for such critical infrastructure. And um, not so long ago, we had the incident with the anonymous Sudan guys who were derosing a number of uh, institutions, organizations, and e-citizen on one of the platforms that was targeted, where we had um, services significantly interrupted uh, because of this. And I think there are a lot of changes being made on the fly uh, because you could see them implementing certain security measures or controls on the fly trying to mitigate this, which means they essentially didn't have certain things in place or whatever they had wasn't as effective or they hadn't thought through such kind of things happening. Um, so this tends to happen a lot across the region and across the industries where until something happens, people don't really put in certain measures. So until that first incident, most people will think we have never had such a thing happening. So why would they target us? But they'll target you because you're the Silicon Savannah. They'll target you because you're boasting to have all the services offered online. They'll target you because it's a soft underbelly, you know? And essentially, in most cases, you'll find government not investing as much as private sector would in terms of security because private sector would easily get um fines from regulators more or less but who's regulating government or who's enforcing it towards government so such kind of services which are critical to the masses and where people need these services to operate if your driving license is expired and there's a ddos on e-citizen that makes you not able to log in that means you can't drive that day or you can't be stopped by a policeman and tell them angalia e-citizen haifunguki you see, it, it won't suffice as an excuse. Yeah, it will be a service that has, it will be something that will have a ripple effect on your ability to do business that day. Because if those were your trucks that needed a certain driver to be driving them and the license has expired, you can't um, essentially renew it, then that means that truck is off the roads for that day, which means whatever economic gain you would have had or that would have been pumped back into the economy, for that day is more or less lost or a deal that you would have seen through maybe lost through that so there are unintended consequences but such platforms and such things are critical to even business operations and have a huge ripple effect so there's a lot of investment that has to be done we primarily look at the private sector safaricom etc airtel and all these other big players because of the financial aspect of things but there are other services that are equally as critical that also need a lot of protection in that sense, which opens the door, yes, to a lot of investment happening uh, cybersecurity-wise. But at the same time, I have a place in my heart for critical infrastructure because I've worked there before. And unfortunately, you may not have the big bucks to do all that is needed, to ring fence, to have... Um, multiple redundant sites to secure whatever data and uh, to recover from incidents. So for small organizations and such kind of uh, small institutions, then it becomes a huge problem for them because there's no financial support to do these things. And also the capacity there is significantly limited. So this does have a huge impact on them because if will have to fork out money for the sake of securing all the systems as is required by this act, then what takes the hit? Do we reduce our marketing? Do we reduce our operations? Do we let go of some people in favor of having this others? Do we fully automate? Do we outsource certain things? There are questions that these organizations have to grapple with because they may not have the financial muscle that other organizations may have, and they don't have any support, essentially, from um, the government or big players. You may train them, but training is one part. Implementing solutions and supporting them is a completely different ballgame and sustaining that. So they are um, two sides of the coin, 
yes, there's been a huge improvement in terms of uh, how serious uh, cybersecurity is taken. But the flip side of it, there's a huge investment, there's a huge other upside or rather downside to it that may not be addressed and people may not talk about as much. So the demand for compliance, the demand for people taking things seriously is there. But how can it be supported and sustained over time? Thank you for that. Um, Lawrence, what's your, what's your view on this? Uh, I, I think the CMC uh, one, from a business point of view, uh, I think uh, we have seen a more than 50% increase in cybersecurity consultancy company. Uh, initially, we had uh, around uh, a handful core companies that were doing cybersecurity. I think right now that number more or less has uh, tripled, which I think is a good thing. Means uh, a lot of, from a business point of view, there's actually value and uh, financial possibilities there because the act itself, as a brand has alluded, uh, if you look at the critical infrastructure, demands, obligates companies to do X, Y, Z. And that means that companies uh, need to look for resources uh to achieve their mandate i think also uh, the act also exposed our underbelly especially when uh, uh we had the anonymous sudan uh, it exposed the fact that yes as much as we, it takes more than an act for the act to be fully functional and for us to uh, benefit from it uh, we need to have that truly multi-stakeholder uh framework with all these different partners talking collaborating effectively and are speaking from uh, the same side uh, has it had any unintended uh, consequences yes i think uh, exposing the underbelly was not one of those in uh, intended uh, consequences so yes uh, as much as organizations are taking cyber security seriously the act well that can that is debatable the act i think has also introduced importance of accountability so yes you have talked of awareness a good number of people are becoming aware of cyber security the risks and people are also knowing that yes we actually now have regulations and laws that demand protect us in regards to what can and can't be done and how either both from a a private point, sector point of view or government sector point of view, how you can go about uh, cyber security activities. Now, wh one thing I think uh, that has uh, recurred here has been uh, the act has, uh, well, well, the act might be good. Uh, there's still that aspect of uh, how do we finance some of those, uh, some of those uh, recommendations in the act and some of those obligations. I've had Brian mention that, yes, finance is a huge factor, which I admit, but I also think uh, if we are being completely honest, uh, Brian and I, because we have been in the consultancy field and we might know a few things that are, are not public, publicly talked or discussed, cybersecurity, a huge part of it has never been about a fi financial incentives because all of these companies make money majority of these companies deliberately choose not to invest in uh, their cybersecurity posture and uh, prefer the reactive uh, approach. Let us be compromised uh, and uh, we'll hire more people, we'll train, you more, we'll train more people. And when that happens, they will actually find those funds to do what needs to be done. And in most cases, the financial commitment there is typically higher compared to being proactive training people, hiring people. So I don't think it's it's a financial issue. It's more of a, an incentive issue. And the act is a, not, only, not only an incentive, it's more of a, a carrot and a stick. And it, look, if you don't eat the carrot too bad, we are still going to uh, smack you if you don't do what is expected of you. And now I, I feel the financial... Uh, challenges are coming in because a lot of organizations do not, not, you don't have an option. You have been treating this as a best effort, but now you're being forced to realign your financial capabilities and ensure that if your critical infrastructure, you're actually 
allocating funds for that. So I think uh, that will be my input as far as that is concerned. Thanks, guys. I love that. I am not only working. Once they are exactly. <laughs> <laughs> what? Sorry, Mutawa, I stepped out a bit. Just rejig my memory on the current question. Sorry, you, you unmute. Unmute. Oh, sorry. Um, we're talking about the impact of the CMCA on, on the businesses and the digital economy. You know how easy uh, 16,000 services, they want to take out 21,000. Um, hmm. how, how, how we're analyzing how is the CMC? What impact? Businesses in Kenya has it enhanced cyber security mm. and cyber resilience adoption, and what are mm -hmm. the consequences for the digital economy? So, the gentleman before you was mm. they, they've all repeated was anonymous Sudan and the DDoS attack on East exposing mm. our under yeah, yeah. Uh, how businesses, uh, that we are motoring, but they don't have the money, but they're not prioritizing cyber security until mm. they're hit hard, and then uh, uh, we have to, do it. That's where we are. yeah, yeah. So, my comment on that is, is, um, is that this the cybercrime act is more on after the fact, it's you know, crime has been committed, how do we handle it? Uh, but that needs to be complemented by other interventions. So interventions like what is our national cybersecurity strategy? Because within that, that's where you will find uh, content around uh, what are the tasks, what are the activities, what are the projects around capacity building, around uh, preventive technologies, uh, things to do with resources that are required to protect our national cyberspace as we get to be more and more digitized. Uh, so I would say you've got to look beyond the act and start investigating to what extent the national cyber crime, no, national cyber security strategy is addressing our posture to protect ourselves um, or to counteract the external enemies appropriately. And in line with that, I think we also need to look at a national uh, cyber security policy. Uh, so those, I think, two things, get a national cyber security policy. Uh, there's been talk of revising the current national cyber security strategy. And uh, most significantly, a recent thing is the Ministry of ICT set up a new um, officer, I think ICT secretary in charge of CyberSec. So those, those are kind of the interventions that could go a long way in making sure that uh, our cybersecurity practices are in line with our uh, digital or digitalization of our processes. Thank you. Thanks for that. And you, and you know, there's something in which um, when I was listening to you gentlemen talking, one of the things that you're all repeating is our critical infrastructure. You have on an e-citizen. You know, that's critical infrastructure. I pose this question, isn't that an act of war against the public of Kenya? Because if you bring down e-citizen, you paralyze operations. You know, Brian, you would, you're giving the example of a driving license or your truck renewal license, but it goes beyond that. We've got over 16,000 services and we're aiming to 21,000 services. If you were to bring down e-citizen, it's technically now it moves into my other hat as a counterterrorism is now a proper cyber attack against the Republic. So it's we it's one thing to have these things in national strategy. Uh,
Um, we also need to develop a national resilience strategy, you know, to ensure that we are operating um, and be able to continue operations despite of and during an, atta an attack. You know, like Brian was saying, people didn't know who to national incident response plan, which involves not just the techies, but the lawyers to mitigate any challenges, the PR people to come out and address people so that we're not getting this. And this This one should be practiced so that it's second nature. The same way like if a fire alarm went off, we all know exit stage left, don't even wait to collect anything, leave, evacuate the building. What happens when we have a national cyber incident of that magnitude? You know, this silo approach, we need to now come and unify it and do test drills so that not when or if, but at the next attack, we are better prepared. You know, we're learning from our, our past mistakes. And this is now where we have to take a proactive approach and not this reactive approach where... Bye, uh, uh, not bye, it has to be bye and bye. That's when we get up. Now we know it's going to happen. It's happening. We're, emb we're embracing digital transformation. Digital transformation has to move side by side with cybersecurity adoption. One cannot be left behind. Because the more we digitally transform, the more we digital transformation. They also need to give budgets for cybersecurity. And this is where we all say cybersecurity is expensive. The tools are expensive. The training of personnel is expensive. But we need to secure it if we're going to embrace e-governance. Um, and so those are some of the things that um, we, we, we need to look at. Um, and finally, when it, finally, we're looking at, we're at advanced stages of signing the Budapest Convention. You know, the Budapest Convention is the world's most robust framework on cyber crime building and information sharing mechanisms, which will help us combat. But we need to work. If we secure Kenya, we can send you. We're as weak as the weakest link in our cyberspace um, uh, union. Brian, I see you have your hand raised up. Yes, um, I'm just responding to us. Um, we are talking about digital transformation. Unfortunately, we had issues on shutdowns. So uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a tough one to sell that we're really pushing for digitalization digital transformation, online business, and such kind of things, then on the flip side, we see certain things happen. So I think even from that perspective, we need to hold ourselves to that regard. If we're pushing for digital transformation, let us also embrace it fully. I hear you. I'm tongue, tongue in cheek. You know, they're the seat table. But now could not start. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I just wanted to support you on on the the um, i don't know the term military the counter offense capability you know uh, as private sector or probably academia or smes we tend to have um interest on sort of recovery but if the attack is state to state, we definitely need to sort of push the wall back to the source. And, and this brings in the other stakeholder, the military. Um, I'm sure they have their own military cyber thing going on, but uh, at the end of the day, as much as it's sort of hidden, you've got to have a place where everybody sees the whole picture because we are one nation. The, the, the military will be protecting our cyberspace, uh, which is owned by the private sector. So they cannot be doing that in, in their own little corner. So at some point, we need to, to sort of disabuse the notion that there is 
security in being miscellaneous. <laughs> and I don't know from your experience with the US cyber teams, I, I don't think they have that trust each other type of approach that i don't think would work well, i think our problem here on the african continent is yeah. um, we this word once we hear security okay. yes david we have engineer obama's He's hand gone. up yeah. he has engineer obama's hand up and uh before maybe he's invited we have an anonymous attendee who is uh who has asked a question and he says, there's this university guy who empesad 14,000 Kenyan shillings by two new University of Nairobi students who are looking for students' hostels along Gara in Nairobi. The particular student went to Ngara where there were vacant rooms. He called the contact person through a mobile number put on the wall of that accommodation area. After calling the guy, he referred him to a lady to assist him with payment issue. The lady showed him the rooms and paid for them via M-Pesa transaction, after which the lady and the guy switched off their phones. The victim reported the case to the nearest police station, got an uh, occurrence book number and other needed documents, but nothing much has been done so far to arrest the culprit. So the question to the panelists is, how is such a digital crime supposed to be handled? And the last one is again maybe from somebody who is still anonymous says, should the cybersecurity be domiciled at the Ministry of Ice Ministry of ICT or the Ministry of Interior? There seems to be an issue between cybercrime management and cybersecurity management. So there is Engineer Obama with his hand up and the two questions. Thank Back to you, um, I think, think. Thank you, David. I think I'll um. I'll respond in two. Um, Walu on what he just raised, um. Cybersecurity, and I was just when he was asking me how do we how do we handle it here. Cybersecurity, as I was saying, in Africa, we have this stereotypical old school thinking of the word security and gava means secret. You know, it is something which public sector, uh, private sector should not be involved. Now, cybersecurity has the word security and it definitely has the national security um, aspect that is. And this is why cybersecurity, um, the, the government's dealing with it, to embrace the harmony you know, work, um, in, in Kenya over the last few years. Initially, we were, we were walking separate paths, but we're now beginning to walk together a lot more. And that's the only way. When we're working multi-sector, multi-agency, to deal with these things. And this um, is a good segue to where should cybersecurity be domiciled, interior or ICT? It's both. Comes to securing our homeland cyberspace, but but what are we both? They both they both need to work together. Here, there's no one who is going to say. I am bigger than the other. We are all equal working, and I love the new government approach, whole of government approach. So my answer to that is cybersecurity is a woga. It's a whole of government approach. Whether you're interior, whether you're ICT, whether you're health, everybody needs to work together and it can't be pegged to one. When it comes to the military aspect of it, obviously the defense people take precedence. When it comes to the systems we require, the ICT people take precedence. Can okay, I open the floor to the others to answer the other question or contribute anything else before we call Engineer Obam? Uh, maybe we have Engineer Obam? Yes, I think we can allow him to speak and we can also continue. Engineer. Yeah, thank you. Uh, 
Let me say that I, I, I like the way you answered the question of where should it lie, at this whole of government approach, because cybersecurity does not target only ICT or uh, interior. <laughs> Um, if you may recall, actually, the original act came from the Minister of ICT, but Parliament, in his wisdom, uh, put it in the Minister of Interior. So, uh, as they say, a rose by any other name will still smell as sweet, as long as you have a framework. But the reason why I raised my hand is um, the contribution you made before is the issue of looking at cybersecurity from a strategic point of view. If we If we do that, then we'll have all this capacity building, we'll know where every block fits in. And uh, I, I think um, that, 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 that would be an important uh, uh, um, strategy to take forward, that we really need to, to have a home, uh, this multi-agency approach or whatever, or role of government approach, which actually, uh, as you mentioned, when NC3 that time was formed, the, the, in the no, they are only governmentally incorporated uh, private sector in it. And I still think you need the conductor, and I'm still putting my, pushing my case for uh, an agency at the national level that looks at the whole cyberspace and then can assign uh, the experts in different, like people in an orchestra with the uh, different instrument playing it. But at the end of the day, the whole piece comes out as one. But the players are different, but the conductor is the one who makes sure that everything moves together. The way we are doing it now, I think um, we, 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 we still have some time to go. So as we think about this, um, how to apply this law, uh, how to modify it, I think we need to look at it from that high level. The, the things we are talking about, be it ICTA with a SAT, CA with a SAT, the DOD with their own SAT. I think th that to me, that going, going, going down to the operational level, the strategic level is still what is missing in our cybersecurity architecture in the country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Engineer. I totally concur with everything you've said. And I, I'm also pushing for that agency and hoping it can be actualized because like you're saying, I love that orchestra analogy. It will be able to trickle down to where it needs to go. Our cyber offensive posture, our cyber defensive posture, you know, government, uh, private sector working together. We all need to work together um, to, to do this. And we really need to look at the strategic, strategic outlook of our cybersecurity profile deeper as we're reviewing this act. I don't know if any of the other panelists wanted to. Yes, yes. Uh, I think there was a question on the ch chat about somebody chewed their MPESA. The current cybercrime act actually section, let me see, was it 35 there about? Yes, handles that. If you receive somebody's I mean, if you receive a MPESA delivered to you in error and you disappear with it, it's an offense. So uh, uh, the, the anonymous attendee had a fairly long story of making payments for you and students, and then the guy disappeared. So I think that I one think was the law has recent pretense as opposed to in error. Oh, okay. Yeah. So either way the, the 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 law covers that what could be missing is implementation um in terms of do the criminal justice system do the police uh take action uh do you then go to court etc maybe that that is the gap but uh the law as currently structured has taken care of that type of offenses thank you Thanks for that. So unless anybody has anything to say, I think we can wind up this conversation this afternoon. And I just want to say the major takeaways from this is that we're happy we have the law. It's um, a good starting point, as well who put others don't even have the law to start off. Um, it's not perfect, but we can work on it and um, uh, steps are being taken. We need to enhance awareness across all sectors. Um, so that people are aware of it and um, enhance capacity. 
And this also requires financial uh, support, not just technical support. Um, we've also uh, spoken about uh, how, why the pros for the pros and cons for a national agency. Um, I love the orchestra analogy to conduct the rest.